Thanks, Alan. I'm Fred Pachalski, for those of you that don't know me. Uh, before we go on, um, there's a book missing from the library. It's by Marianne Snowden, who's uh, paddling the Broken Islands. If you happen to have it in your library at home, please return it. Thank you. Um, before I introduce Alan, um, in the past, Siska has co-sponsored with um, Ocean River the real, um, what's now called the Paddling Film Festival. But because of COVID, it has been put on the shelf for a number of years. And they recently, actually as early as the spring, started it up again. Um, a decision was made by the board, the assistant board, to go ahead and do one this year, but with a twist that I think you're going to appreciate. Um, so on November 16th, here in this uh, meeting space, at 7 o'clock, um, Cisco will be putting on, for Cisco members only and their guests, who won't be selling tickets to the public, um, the Paddling Film Festival. So um, there's approximately, well, there's 30 separate films. They're festival films that um, um, they actually edit down to um, anywhere from 10 minutes to um, 50 minutes. Um, and what we'll do is um, select enough for at least two hours uh, to show. So um, bring a date. Okay. Um, the next presentation is going to be done by uh, Alan Campbell, Barry Copeland, Debbie Leach, Jenny Sutton, Phil Barrett, Michael Alvinston, and Willie Eldridge. I wanted to make sure that I didn't leave anybody out. The title, as you can see um, from behind me, is BC Central Coast Kayak Trip, Bella Bella to Port Hardy or How I Survived the Rain Festival. Ellen? Okay. Yeah. Ellen? Yeah. 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 I'll start, but what we have done, just so you know, and you'll see an outline shortly, is we've divided it up. All seven of us are taking a spot here, and uh, we've agreed to keep our remarks to about five minutes. This should be very interesting. Uh, the, uh, the hook is, is not being applied directly, but you know, uh, there will be some kind of going on out there, perhaps by others, if, uh, if I ramble on. So at any rate, uh, you heard the names of uh, the group. We were a seasoned group, and we were attempting a fairly significant trip, Central Coast. And I think I'm just going to advance the slide and see the group of seven. This is our our, our shot. I see. I see it. Okay. And that's what I was going to say. So Jenny's already giving me instructions here. And this is part of her talk because uh, we've, we've given the sections to different people, but Jenny's name didn't appear there. So, way you go, Jenny. Here's the uh, clicker right here. It used to be there. It's there. It's there. It has a, a right arrow. Yeah. Two adjacent sections. Good evening. So. He was starting to steal my thunder. And that's actually my photo. And uh, every trip we do, we traditionally take a group photo, and I have to set up a self timer, and then they all get to join me rushing to get in the picture. <laughs> we look pretty good for the end of the trip. You know, or Sanger. Okay, so as Alan said, we're all going to do a section. And I think just sit back and enjoy the slides. This is, uh, I think, being taped, isn't it? Yes. Yep. yep, so just sit back and enjoy the trip. Yep. So I'm covering logistics, which uh, is all the pre-trip planning, which actually uh, for all of us takes some time, being on any kind of trips. Um, so where to go? Choices, choices, choices. We wanted to do this trip in 2020 and then COVID hit. And it, um, that resulted in some of the camp being close to us by First Nations. Anyway, you can see, does this have a pointer? In the middle, between the two arrows. Oh, there we are. So you can see we've got all of Vancouver Island, and really from Vancouver all the way up to the border, plus Haida Gwaii, where to go, where to go. 
and when to go. So when to go can depend whether you're taking ferries, because that decides your start date. And um, tide heights it can be important because if you're going when you've got really high tides, it can uh, limit beach camping, and then you're stuck with upland camping, and there might not be any. You can work out roughly how many miles you're going to go, how many days you're going to need, building weather days about every four days, um, and then looking at people's commitments. And who will go? As Alan said, this was going to be one of our more challenging trips because um, there was major crossings, channels, rivers, inlets. Uh, Cape Caution was in there. We were going to have surf launches and landings. We knew for sure. We knew there was going to be some longer distance days due to fewer campsites. It was going to be almost three weeks duration. Uh, so we needed that skill set, all of us. But we, most of us have paddled together off and on since 2015, so we knew each other's strengths and weaknesses. And uh, a big one can be how many people to have in the group. We went up to seven with six tents, and um, that can be a challenge for camping. So BC ferries, because we needed to go on the ferry to get up north to um, McLaughlin Bay, which is just south of Bella Bella. Uh, you book and pay, oop. Uh, you go on the BC, web, uh, BC Ferries website to book. And in 2022, most of us being seniors, it was $68 for the ferry and $10 for the kayak. Make sure you pay for the kayak as well. <laughs> uh, I dealt directly with Port Hardy Terminal. I was advised to do that by central office as staff have more accurate information, particularly about kayak carts. Uh, I'll put the phone number on there as well. So kayak cart versus carrying kayak wheels for three weeks, what would you prefer to do? <laughs> I know what I like to do. So uh, Jenny made a number of phone calls over the months to make sure we were going to have a kayak cart for us. Um, just for your interest, there's Port Hardy, and it's this beautiful trip all the way up to Belton, McLaughlin Bay. So the accommodation of Port Hardy, there, there's um, several choices. The, the cheapest, is, uh, besides camping, would be the Backpackers Hostel and a forwarding with that. Uh, they can really get booked out around the ferry schedule, so you want to organize and book early. We used to go to park for free, not sure that happens anymore. And then there's a whole list of the various places down here. Uh, I have launched at Carrot Park before, and then it's where do you park your car. Uh, and there's a First Nations hotel with lovely decor and a pretty good restaurant. So part, there was quite a lot of discussion about how to park and manage the kayaks. And, um, it just depends where you're going to stay in Port Hardy. Um, so that was that. Okay, stay in court today. So that just shows you a picture of what the cart looks like. If you haven't seen one before, and uh, it takes up to eight boats, and you have to load them yourself. And you can decide yourself how much stuff you want to put in them, but you have to get the cars up there. Um, we uh, always go through a trip contract, and we met earlier in the year, discussed chart charts and routes, and who was going to carry kayak carry straps and how much water and all that. But because we knew each other pretty well, we thought, we sort of limited the discussion on expectations. Uh, we also, and Deb has been our secretary for this, we do a float plan uh, with um, information and our cell numbers, and usually we have emergency contact people on it as well. Okay. Um, Alan, for the trips I've done, has the inReach, and we have a link for friends and family. So what did we end up doing? We were able to drop the kayaks off at Bear Cove with the ferry terminal the afternoon before we left, and that was fabulous. It means we could sleep in an extra hour the next morning. Um, the staff knew we were coming because I had made a number of phone calls, and they were ready with a cart for us. Uh, we stayed at the quarter deck um, and had a pub meal, meal next door at the Glen Lion. Um, the reason we stayed at the quarter deck was because um, there's a launch right there that could launch for free if you were staying there, and they had parking, paid parking right there. Um, the next morning, we drove to the ferry, dropped off many IKEA bags plus water onto the carts, and again, the staff were waiting for us. Then the drivers took vehicles back to the quarter deck parking and took a taxi back 
and the taxis are ready for you. They, this is where they make their main money, is when the ferries come and go. Uh, on our return, this was the beauty. We, let, we landed at the boat launch at the quarter deck, and then the cars were like a two-minute walk away. And uh, that was the promise we had on the first day, and there's more to come from Michael. Mm -hmm. Good job, Jenny. First thing I want to say, I did not qualify for the seniors writers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, research. Uh, I'm mostly just going to foreshadow a few things because uh, a number of the other 18 people are going to speak to you tonight um, are going to go into things in a little more depth than I am. Uh, Jenny did a pretty thorough overview of logistics and lots of times I don't think we necessarily think about logistics as being part of the research for a trip but it absolutely is it's, it's, it's really a big part in terms of the actual area that we looked at some of the primary resources we used were um, John Comantis's um, Wild Coast books his maps certainly the BC Marine trails uh, were really important um, uh, source of information and fortunately a, a number of the people on the trip uh, had already been up in that area, so they were able to share their experience, which was really helpful. Um, from a research standpoint, which I never did pick up, and maybe I didn't do enough research, I was really struck by, given how many islands that are up there, uh, from a rope planting perspective, there really isn't that many places to camp. So, in terms of the route, that's me still, um, as with most trips, there's a planned route and then there's what you actually end up doing, and they don't always um, coincide. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Uh, and this trip certainly required a number of in-route planning adjustments. Um, but before we get there, really looking at, in, in thinking about your route, um, think about uh, that equaling a function of the group uh, times the time you have, times the sea and weather conditions, times the geography. So in terms of the group, um, think about the group size. And this, this was seven, um, seven people, six tents, and as uh, Jenny alluded, I would argue that that was really on the cusp of, of, of being a bit big. It's, it's, uh, it really impacts where you can launch and where you can land and, and camp. Um, but even without thinking about camping, there were some times when bio breaks sort of took place almost in um, rotation because there really wasn't enough room uh, to get seven boats um, on the uh, beach at the same time. Um, and uh, certainly, uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. yeah, so uh, as, as well, thinking about the group, where, where you're going to route plan here, um, thinking about the paddling skills and risk tolerance of the group, that certainly is going to impact the days that you're going to paddle, the winds, the sea conditions that you're going to go in, and where you're going to find those. Fitness level of the group, is going to determine how hard people can paddle, how far they can paddle, and how long they're prepared to be in the boats. And finally, the health of the group is um, uh, going to um, uh, impact. Um, paddling conditions certainly aren't static, and you need to plan around those. There were uh, a number of big open uh, bodies of water that, that we went through, and um, in, in terms of those, that can really provide some um, challenging sea conditions, but at the same time, if you're able to wait out, get some good weather, plan for your tides and currents, it can also be really benign. Uh, time obviously impacts, the, the more time that you have, the further you can go, but it's not just how far you can go, you can build in more camp days, more weather days, um, and so that's something that you need to take into account. And certainly geography is going to dictate your route, depending on not only um, what you want to see, but um, where you're going to get protection, uh, the further that you're in exposed seas, uh, this can be more challenging conditions, and you're probably also going to have to deal with some surf. So. On this trip, we had initially, let's see if this thing works, we had initially planned on um, heading out to the open, uh, open side of the goose group, staying outside, outside Calvert Island, 
uh, in reality, because of weather, um, we ended up coming inside, this is all approximate, not good lines with the mouse, uh, and then coming down uh, the inside. Now, we ended up having to make route adjustments like an hour into the trip. Uh, as Jenny indicated, when, when we landed, it was, it was beautiful, but um, kind of an hour in, we were, were hoping to head uh, east um, off, uh, if you see, heading up. Uh, oh no, I got this completely wrong. No. No, you're right. Double right. Double. 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 Okay. So we, um, we came and uh, Alan Campbell Island here. So <laughs> as we came into uh, Seaforth Passage, um, we had we planned to go east because we knew some. West. Hmm? Left. Left. Yeah, left. <laughs> oh, west. West. Yes, west. <laughs> Not east. We ended up going east. Um, some headwinds, some chop late in the day, so we ended up. Um, making a decision as a group and headed to Rainbow Island. Next day, um, in order to, to um, uh, wait out some weather, we headed to Gale Passage, got weathered in there for a few days. That was kind of, whoops. Up in around here. Uh, not a particularly pleasant couple of days. Um, the following day, once we got out of there, we had some more rain, you'll hear all about this later, but um, we had a place called The Sound, and it was not a big place, I'd say probably six or seven was, was about max, but talking about route planning and weather conditions, um, a commercial group came in, um, because they couldn't get out to the goose group, they're on a water tax, and there's 12 of them, and um, uh, Alan, our lovely host, uh, tried to instill that upon them, but somehow they squeezed in, got 12 more, more people on a, a very uh, cushy uh, island and um, were given a, a lovely tree talk by his eminence Morley, <laughs> the tree man. Um, following that, we ended up, uh, and, and this was, was, uh, was, was a beautiful place, but we ended up on a route down the North Beach on, on Calvert Island. And when we talk about uh, geography um, uh, playing a part, we headed off as a group and the next day we were in the boats for about 11 hours because there really was nowhere uh, to camp. So that made for a very long day and uh, fun for some of us setting up in the rain, but you'll, you'll see more about the uh, um, uh, camping opportunities. But once, uh, once we got to the north or sorry, south end of uh, Calvert, and up here, you can see there's only really one route to go. And as we, as we um, uh, came down there, we um, uh, went past, uh, across Smith, Smith Sound, down around Cape Cosh, and back towards Port Hardy. But as we were looking, again, needing to uh, adjust our route, um, we had to cut our trip short a day, uh, which was unfortunate because there was a couple of lovely um, camp spots that we were at, but um, uh, a 40 knot wind was predicted and that's when we needed to cross back over Vancouver Island and um, the time factor coming in there as well, not sure how long that was supposed to last. So uh, we cut it a day short and uh, had good weather across. And now I'm going to turn it over to you, Alan. Good job, Michael. Decision-making. So I'm not going to read these things out, I'll let you see that or you can take a look at it later when it's posted on YouTube. But basically what you need to know is we made decisions as a group. There was no specified leader. Some people had been in the area before, some hadn't. We had things to contribute, but we negotiated what, what happened. And they, those I think are the responsibilities that we all felt as we went along and we really did have to make use of them. So how do you do that? Well, finding a suitable uh, time and space to plan together it is really important. And then just having respect for each other's abilities and experience and keeping the conversation going. Uh, we didn't count on doing this on the trip, which is a good thing. 
this is what happened on the ferry trip. <laughs> We'd had a late early start rather, and uh, so we were catching up on sleep. But there were some key opportunities. This was uh, kind of one of the more ideal opportunities. A nice time on the beach, you know, you can lay out the chart, have a good discussion and decide what to, where to go next and when. So those are the opportunities. How do you, how do, you uh, do this and what is it that you try to do? Uh, I think these things will get mentioned over and over and, and I, I like the way that Michael set it up. <clears throat> Paddler's health, <clears throat> well it changes, doesn't it? <clears throat> so we need to keep checking with, with each other. You know, how are you doing today? Just, just in a friendly way, find out how everybody is. Gears, gear and boats uh, can be challenging. You, you, you might need to fix something or, or just work something out. And then the realities of the route for each day, um, something to take into account. Basically, the, the wind, the swell, the weather, these are gonna dictate what we can do. We had what you might expect with the Coast Guard continuous marine broadcast kind of thing, but it's really not made for near shore paddling. Dark sky, which is available through inReach, and then we were lucky enough to have Weather Heather, who was <laughs> Heather Jones at the back. Heather was uh, good enough to send us a couple of days weather every day on our inReach, and that really did help because we had some we had some decisions to make, and they were hinged on what we could expect in the next couple of days. Make sure everybody has their say. Uh, some people don't like to put it out there, what they're thinking, especially if it's maybe kind of going a bit against the grain, but that's really important, even more important, if it's not kind of going in the general way, to have that part of the conversation. And then there isn't any perfect plan, and you only have to go on a kayak trip to, <clears throat> you know, with any kind of weather to, to know that, so really be open to what options might be possible. And then just continue the discussion. This is a tough thing to do, uh, waiting and listening and then figuring out, maybe it's not your ideal, but what can you live with? You know, what is it that you would be willing to do if other people are pretty well uh, coming together around something that wasn't your first option? <laughs> we need to always, and this is true with day paddles around here as much as anything, but change uh, to meet the realities out there. Um, I must say, I don't always do this well. I get impatient on the water. I'm kind of wanting to get up to a, a rhythm and stay there, but it's important to stop, to be there for everybody, depending on their paddling speed. Uh, stop and talk on the water or land briefly if you can, and make sure everybody's doing okay. Some might be having some difficulties, and how can those be made easier? How can you address them? Basically, you have a plan that's maybe been worked out through some negotiation process and then try to follow that until you agree on another plan. Uh, this is all about communication. It's really hard to do that on the water. So that's why when you're on the water and people are now at some distance, um, you know, it's important to follow what your last agreed plan was and maybe somebody who's agreed to say lead the way across this body of water until we can call everybody together again and, and make a change. And there were lots of, of changes and lots of opportunities to uh, reconsider based on conditions and so on. Some challenges on this trip. Well, you're going to hear a lot about the rain. Uh, <clears throat> the long paddling days, that was kind of a correlate of the rain and the high winds that accompanied the rain because we were unable to um, do what we had thought might be our plan and yet we had a destination in mind. Actually, we one option was not to get to our destination, but in fact to paddle back to McLaughlin Bay and catch a ferry. Uh, but we kind of crossed the point of no return when we headed south of Cal on Calvert Island. Um, so, you know, that meant long paddling days. Uh, campsites have been mentioned. Navigating in fog, <clears throat> very uh, tricky business at the best of times. Important if you're navigating in fog and you feel like you you, you know, you're, you're reasonably prepared, you have a, a, a little GPS device and it's kind of showing you where you are, but in my case, I can't actually see that. <laughs> it's too <clears throat> small. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> leaving out the adjective there. So, my friend Jenny uh, Sutton, uh, you know, uh, took on the responsibility of actually watching my device because she can see. And, uh, and then don't get too kind of sure of yourself. And there were times like that along the way as well. <clears throat> so we certainly had some challenges on this trip. 
Um, I wanted to show you this just because this was the long paddling day that was mentioned, and the top left there was North Beach on Calvert. It was kind of hard to leave that place. Sunny day, first in a, quite a long while. A drying cycle, we called it, had started, and we were getting a little bit drier. And when we left, we were hoping for um, you know, a reasonable paddling day, but then not finding campsites meant we had to come all the way down uh, to Fury Cove to camp. And that was the 11 hour day that uh, Michael mentioned. And of course, it was rainy by the time we got there. We had to go through fog. You know, so what started off as a, a nice day ended up being pretty tough. Uh, this was day 12. This is our inReach post, uh, just so you see. Um, this was Lynn, I think, who's a very uh, optimistic lady. <laughs> she put it all out there and then still smiling. I like that. <laughs> if you can say that, if you really can still smile, then you're doing something right. This was us looking for a campsite on that day. You notice how crappy a picture it is because my camera was really pretty wet, or whoever's camera this is was, had some water on the lens. Uh, this one didn't work out. There wasn't really a place that we could camp there, so kind of keep on going. Uh, and the fog, you know, I thought this picture is interesting because you see three kayaks in three different directions. <laughs> <laughs> that probably means we haven't reached consensus yet. <laughs> exactly where we're going and where that is, uh, so important to do that. And I, I, I accept my responsibility everybody, as much as anybody else in this, but here we are all going, kind of going more or less the same direction and uh, heading into the fog. So it's a, it's a different kind of experience when you're in a big body of water. I have a feeling this was going across uh, north of Rivers Inlet, but a, a big chunk of water anywhere. anyway. And then Cape Caution, so this is the kind of too cocky bit. A little bit because we uh, the weather did improve as we went south and in terms of decisions they seemed to get easier we were getting into the get up early and go and get off the water early and we had some pretty good experience so we were concerned about Cape Caution we approached it with caution and then all the way to Cape Caution it was like really nice and so people were you can see this is taken quite close in so people were like well we could you know let's get a selfie here at cape caution it's uh, you know we don't often get to be this close and then it turned on us <laughs> because we were going with a flood which in that part of the world as you find out uh, goes from north to south which is a good idea but if you go around the cape just around the cape uh, it's uh, it's not going your way. It's <laughs> got a vicious back eddy that will drive you back. So anyway, in conclusion, I would say, and I've been on a number of, of challenging trips, this was one of them. We did a lot of things right in Pittsburgh. We did help each other. That's important. Uh, we waited for better conditions. We certainly did. Um, we did endure the lows, and, and we did have highs to celebrate as well. And most importantly, and I think I say this with some assurance, we stayed friends. We're still smiling. That uh, picture, by the way, is uh, Morley and Michael helping Barry out uh, at Burn Burnett Bay as a surf uh, launch, and uh, I think we were all glad to have Morley and, and Michael help us out. They were kind of our more experienced launchers there, so it was good. Well done. All right. Uh, I am Barry. And I'm going to talk briefly about uh, our planning and some of our experiences as we crossed uh, a number of points, capes, and currents. Um, so, uh, as far as planning goes, uh, you know, these are obviously dynamic waters, as many of you have probably already experienced. Um, in my opinion, that they, they do take a bit of planning, and uh, you know, as I mentioned here, an extra help in that respect. Uh, they can be very humbling, they can be very unpredictable at times. So before I go on a trip like this, I gather as much information as I can uh, before I leave, uh, whether that's checking out various blogs on the internet, various blogs out there. Um, John Comantis, I think one of us has already mentioned uh, his publications. He goes into details on various areas um, along this trip, as, as uh, he does with many other uh, locations on the coast as well. And um, I, I gain confidence by um, gaining as much knowledge as I can before I go out and uh, enter these, these waters. So the planning is crucial. Um, even more important is the planning and staging as we, um, at, at, when we're on the trip. 
Um, so, you know, these are a few points that I think we followed um, before we ventured out into these dynamic waters, before we crossed uh, Cape's points in particular. Um, so, uh, first and foremost, we would wait for a forecast with low wind and low swell. And you know, if that takes three days, um, that's what it takes in order to find um, the forecasts that we're comfortable with. And what I mean by uh, low wind and low swell, uh, well, you know, in detailed numbers, if, if, uh, if I may, I would say definitely less than two meters of swell um, and less than 15 knots of wind. Much, much less is even better. No question about that. Uh, we chose to camp uh, close by whenever possible, especially on the major points and, and Cape, uh, the Cape itself. Um, we didn't want to try and fit that Cape into uh, the end of our paddling day just to get it done. Uh, it wouldn't be a, have been a good idea. Uh, morning crossings usually offer lower wind, usually not always, and uh, usually your paddlers have your, your maximum uh, energy levels at that time of day as well. So and that's all we did. Um, we had to inspect boomers close to rocks and shoreline. Um, boomers, of course, are similar to the photo that I showed you um, in the introduction there. Um, very large waves and swell that hammer into very large rocks. And this is, they're, they're beautiful and they're to be expected. We used to see them uh, when we ventured through across these points. Um, beautiful to see, but I personally like to stay and keep a good distance from them. They pack a lot of power. Uh, my experience is that you get too close to them, it's pretty hard to get away from them sometimes as well. So uh, sometimes this involves paddling a fair ways offshore in order to get a safe distance from these boomers. And that can be a little bit disconcerting at times, especially if there is wind and waves. Um, but it certainly is a safety thing to do than to get too close to these. So here's just an example of a few of our experiences. Uh, Superstition Point was one that um, jogs my memory. Um, this is on Hunter Island, which is north of Calvert. Um, we were camping very close by at a very soggy campsite, I believe that was uh, Culta Sound, uh, where we had waited for the opportunity to, uh, to leave that very soggy and muddy campsite. Um, the opportunity finally came up, and in this instant, the uh, forecast uh, was calling for winds to actually subside later in the morning, from what I remember. And so we ventured out about mid-morning or so, and we got, when we got to the point, uh, the actual sea state was still kind of volatile. It had been uh, windy the day before and overnight, um, and uh, you know it was dying down, but it hadn't settled down quite as much as we hoped for, I guess you could say, yet. So you know, it wasn't bad, but it was a little bit volatile. We did have to concentrate. We were in one to two meters of, uh, of swell and confused seas and fairly sharp waves, which means that uh, you know, you're concentrating on your paddling and you're making sure that your kayak's not going to be broaching and facing the waves sideways and this sort of thing. Um, lots of outlying rocks and boomers from what I remember here, so once again we did paddle fairly far offshore to safely get around this point. Um, and then a little bit further down we were leaving our lovely campsite on the north end of uh, Calvert Island. Uh, we were going through Quachua Channel, which was very, very calm. Um, but as we got closer to Fitzhugh Sound, which is the large sound, let's see if we can work this. Maybe I can. It's about the. Okay, I got it. Okay. Okay, here we go. I got it now. All right, so as we got to this point here, which is Wedgeboro Point, um, things were picking up. We, uh, there, was, there was waves and current against us. Uh, the sea state was uh, fairly abruptly changing. And so when we got to that point, we rafted together and we qu quickly decided that we were going to stay quite, uh, quite more tightly together as a group. We designated one lead, one sweep. Everybody stayed within those two. And we, waited, we, we made our way down the, uh, the east coast of Calvert in that manner. Um, when we got uh, about halfway down Calvert, we got to the narrowest area to cross Fitzhugh Sound. And uh, then we, uh, we changed our paddling, paddling pattern to cramps in the box, as many of you have probably heard before, uh, where we're ba basically just lining up in a row and crossing that way. That way we can look left and right and keep track of everybody and uh, without having to look behind our shoulder in volatile situations. And we were quite, um, uh, we were visible to mariners as well. And there was plenty of motorcraft in that area also. So that was the safest way to, to cross. And we made, made it was just fine like that. Um, and then Cape Caution, of course, uh, Alan's already talked about this quite a bit, so I'll just brush on it very, very quickly. 
Um, as Ellen mentioned that morning, there was a lot of anticipation about Cape Caution. Uh, you know, Command just um, calls it uh, one of the toughest stretches of open water on the BC coast, or at least it can be. Um, you know, it's where um, we've got Queen Charlotte Sound, Queen Charlotte Strait, and um, Smith Sound. They all converge with their own currents onto this one point that shows, juts out from the land. So, you know, very dynamic, uh, you know, very exciting, and sort of, of course, we paddled out, and my picture is actually even calmer than Alan's picture. <laughs> <laughs> and so there we were, there I am, uh, you know, just on the north side of the Cape, looking at the marker there, um, being pretty smug, thinking uh, we're pretty lucky to be this close in. But, you know, as Alan mentioned, when we uh, did cross that Cape, then uh, things got pretty volatile, and, uh, you know, I described it as a bit of an aquatic roller coaster for the next uh, not of a mile or so. So my takeaway from that Cape experience was, I'm really not done with the Cape until I'm completely out of that Cape area. <laughs> Um, so that was a good experience for me. Uh, just a little bit about currents as well. Um, points and capes are best crossed at slack tide, lowest current, of course. Um, river inlets, and there was a number of river inlets that we did cross. Um, keeping in mind they're flowing towards the ocean, which creates a stronger ebb. Um, uh, something to keep in mind when you're making these crossings. Um, we basically measured our, uh, you know, our, our, we studied our currents through the tide tables and current tables, the CHS tide tables. We, um, we all had them printed off. Um, I've got, I won't mention all the uh, stations that we used there, but they're on the slide there if you want to make a note of that. Um, and as um, is quite often the case, there wasn't a lot of current stations in that area. So basically we did a lot of the estimating of current. Um, based on current uh, tide change times and tide ranges, which of course are affected by the moon and this sort of thing. And uh, that's how we made our, a lot of our decisions uh, on currents. Sometimes they were fairly accurate and sometimes <laughs> could have been a bit more accurate. Um, but anyways, by using these principles, we managed to uh, cross through all the capes and inlets and currents uh, uh, points uh, uh, very safely, and, uh, and here we are. Mm -hmm. So uh, thanks very much. So campsites were my area of concern, and as you mentioned, BC Marine Trails is a great resource, as well as Comantis Resources. And this is what you can see beforehand, um, the first campsite uh, around the planned route, uh, Gale Passage East, you get an idea of the location, the landing comments, camping, and water hazards, etc. So that was handy. And we had nine campsites during our trip. The ones that I put in italics were not on the BC Marine Trails network, and I'll explain that a little bit more. Rainbow Island was the first place we stopped because if we yeah, went north from Port Hardy and tried to turn left, it was going to be a bit gnarly. So we preferred not to fight a headwind in the middle of the day. And actually people that uh, we saw at McLaughlin Bay when we were putting in had camped there and they said the First Nations folks seemed quite fine with that so we sort of snuck in for a one night stand. Gale Passage, we had four nights. Um, you can see it was a quite an interesting time keeping uh, yourself amused by uh, circumnavigating the island several times a day just to keep busy. <laughs> and Morley's got some uh, great uh, video footage of what he found when he went exploring. Um, Cultus Sound is where the Spirit of the West came in with the water taxi dropping off 12 kayaks and kayakers. And we thought, how are we going to fit? Because it's a very shallow beach, and we reach out to four to six sites, but somehow they squeezed in and managed quite well. Um, definitely saw signs that there could be a toilet there, with much nicer camping. Trickett Island, uh, we've been to before. Years ago, we knew that there was archaeological digs going on, but it was the only game in town that night. And it seemed like there'd been lots of people camping there anyway. We weren't anywhere near the digs, and so we skedaddled the next day. North Beach on Calvert 
was where I heard that if we didn't get some sun, somebody was going to slit their wrist. <laughs> yeah. The sun came out enough for us to do some drying and have a nice wash in the water uh, and get around to the Hakai, past the Hakai Institute and do uh, a walk that Barry will explain uh, a little bit later. So it was uh, really, really uh, rejuvenating. At the end of the long day, uh, we found Fury Cove in the Penrose Group, also not on Earth, BC Marine Trails. And after 25 nautical miles, we didn't really care. <laughs> and uh, you can see the ambience in the cabin. Five people slept in the cabin. Uh, Michael and I uh, set up camp. And uh, okay. it was good. <laughs> um, there were a couple places in the woods, and now I decided to camp on the, the Shell Beach, which is my favorite kind of beach. Mm -hmm. That was very relaxing as well. We had two days, and the highlight for me was when Barry got to go fishing, and we got to taste the results of his fishing. <laughs> Open bite, when we came south along the mainland shore, gave us the option of camping on the beach or in a little cabin that was recently erected, and as well as a 40 meter walk across to the other side a nice little cabin that actually Michael got to stay in that night, so it was his dream. Red Sands Beach in Smith Sound was uh, as we landed after our foggy day, and some of the upland sites were needed a little bit of uh, changing the furniture to have some steps up to reach them. Burnett Bay, the little cabin there was built in 1985 by Randy Washburn, and there's another cabin there as well, but we didn't choose to stay inside that. Shelter Bay was our last campsite, another white sandy beach, quite lovely. By this time, we were like one night, one night, one night. We would have liked to have stayed longer, but our time was used up. So there's definitely lots of places that you can stay there. And it's fairly reachable from the Deer Group if you're coming up from Port Hardy, um, past there, and just north on to the mainland well, shore. Deserters. <laughs> Deserters? Yeah. And you said Deer Group. Oh, sorry. Sorry. God's Pocket. Wasn't the Deer Group. <laughs> God's Pocket. God's Pocket, sorry. Okay, so uh, one of the things that BC Marine Trails was asking for people to do this summer was to do site condition reports. So actually we, we worked on those to show whether the, the sites were uh, accurately portrayed on BC Marine Trails as far as um, the locations correct, the information there on landing, tent sites, um, water, um, fire, conditions, if there have been fires in the area that were burning and not burning. Um, clean up information, toilet information, and uh, some photos that you could add in. So we sent those in for our trip. And then we also had a place that Lynn and Morley said, hey, I think this could be a new campsite. So we filled in a site assessment report that was a potential campsite uh, south of Bramham Island between Burnett and Shelter Bays. You can see there, we actually approached from the north and had a look in and thought it was going to be a campsite. And there's Morley pulling back the cedar to show uh, what we like to camp in that rock cave. Maybe probably six tents could fit in there. <laughs> so that's a little bit of potential campsites that we had. They certainly were. Uh, some of them were a bit far between. But, uh, they were there. Okay. So next we have me, Lynn. Lynn. What's up? Thank you. Okay. What to take? I. You'll notice I used a senior spot here. Everybody in the back can see it. Okay. Seriously, the most important thing to take is a good attitude. If you're going to go to the Central Coast and it's going to rain, 
rain, rain, rain, the rain, the rain, the wind, the fog, and if you don't keep that in mind, know it's going to happen, you're doomed. So, yeah, but having a little bit of good gear doesn't hurt. So here's our CAG crew. Uh, they wore them a lot on our first little island because they give the most coverage. And here we are huddling for warmth and uh, um, under the tarps. You'll notice everybody's wearing rubber boots or uh, Crocs. Lots of Gore-Tex and Helis were invaluable. Our little floating island. Yes, it was wet. Morley has a good little video coming up of uh, the rain coming in there. So huddle for warmth and laughter. Uh, again, you need a good attitude. And bring a book, too, because if you do get holed up on an island for, for days on end, then you, you definitely want something to do besides laps around the island. <laughs> Perfect your tarping. Uh, here's a couple of little uh, methods we use to uh, get the tarp nice and I always say happiness is a tight tarp. Um, Morley's umbrella gave up the, the ghost in uh, short order, but an umbrella is a good idea also. Uh, oh, this is uh, the first time I brought this out, but uh, you know, if you get, get lemons, make lemonade. If it's going to pour, you might as well do your water collection off the end of the tarp. Okay. There's Ellen's tarp. Pick your tent site carefully if you can. Uh, yes, our cultist sound spot, we called it less than affectionately, the river runs through it. Uh, and Michael, when he set up his tent, uh, it was sand in front, and uh, the next morning it was a boat. Um, this is on Trickett? Trickett. Uh, we did, the tide was so high that we couldn't do much beach camping. I think Jenny squeezed in down there. The rest of us were upland, and Michael brought his hammock, so he moved the IKEA bags underneath, and the tide came up and under him uh, for a short while in the night. <laughs> and remember to enjoy the sunshine when it does show up. Uh, and I've also been asked to do highlights, so here are my highlights. Jenny took a million good pictures. Um, I'm only showing a few. We had this one wonderful little passage where uh, the intertidal was, uh, I think maybe Browning Passage is the only place that has ever come close to what we saw. There were just like 20 foot walls of, of uh, Plymouth anemones, so many ochre stars, bat stars, well not bat stars, uh, leather stars. Uh, there's, I think that's Jenny's that's taken underwater. Riddle stars. Oh. This is a highlight for me too. Going into our campsite on uh, Calvert, there's just a series of these wonderful white rocks that I just, for some reason or another, just really capture me. And the shorebirds were amazing. And flowers, lots and lots of flowers everywhere. And yeah, mink, humpbacks, sea lions, seals, wolf tribes, no bears. I thought we were in bear country, but uh, no bears. White-sided dolphins, we had a little uh, pot of them go through. Um, yeah, all the, all the usual, some sandhill cranes up there too. They're good fun. And there's a humpback. That's Jenny's picture again. Uh, we got good and close to them. We saw humpbacks pretty much every single day. And then on our last day, we were treated to orcas. Yeah, they were, they were pretty close. So anyway, it was it was a good trip. Highlights very. All right. Well, what's a kayak trip? I've done a little bit of fishing. I always say. <laughs> um, this is the. Uh, it, we only got one. I only got one uh, fishing trip in on the whole trip because we were just too busy paddling and fighting rain and weather and. And everything else but anyway uh, fishing is my zen and that's what I love to do 
Um, it provides us with a really nice break from dehydrated chili, I find, <laughs> and uh, it can have its exciting moments as well. So that was one of my good memories. Um, here's my fishing gear. Um, I, I won't go through this in detail for everybody. Uh, the slide will be uh, on, on the website at one point or another. Two things to remember if you're ever interested in fishing. Uh, first thing is making sure everything is latched because when you get the big fish, if it's not, like if, if you don't have your, uh, your gear tied to your kayak, you're gonna lose it for sure. And the second most important thing to bring, of course, is your lucky fish bag. You gotta have a fish <laughs> bag ready uh, when you catch that big fish. Um, so other uh, points that really, uh, really thrilled me, uh, that were just absolutely stunning that I'll never forget really, is this, in, I call it the infinity bog on North Calvert Island. Um, it, we were camped on the beach looking out to that beautiful white rock that uh, Lynn was showing us just a few minutes ago. Um, we hiked through a boardwalk and a beautiful trail um, up quite a ways, uh, quite a distance to this beautiful bog. And you can't see it quite as well in this picture, but I think in this picture, um, look behind the, the two fellows, I think that's Alan and, and uh, uh, can't think of the other person. There's a bog in the foreground, behind the, uh, the, the other two is that, the actual coastline itself. So I call that the infinity bog, it seems to go on forever. Um, yeah, just a beautiful spot there, very picturesque. Uh, another, uh, this, this is a closer version of uh, just looking from the bog out to the open sea there. A uh, beautiful trail just in the middle of nowhere made up by um, uh, the Hakai Conservatory. And there's, uh, I forget, what, what is the name of the Hakai Institute? Hakai Institute? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Hakai Institute. It's a learning facility that uh, some rich person has, has built on North Calvert. I don't know the entire history of it, but um, it made these beautiful trails that are just absolutely stunning. Uh, another view from the bog looking to the, um, to the other side of the beach. Uh, and on the trail back to our campsite, uh, this is the same area, uh, and more bogs, more beautiful bogs uh, all, all along the way back, uh, which turned into a, a welcome tepid spot as well. Um, another area that I'll never forget is Burnett Bay. This is just south of Cape Caution. So we passed the Cape and then we landed in this beautiful bay. Um, and it was stunning, beautiful driftwood. The, the beach uh, just went on for miles and miles. And uh, we shared the beach with uh, two or three other people, three other campers, about uh, what was it, three or four miles down the beach. And uh, just a lovely spot there. Uh, in, in my opinion, I'm always looking for the perfect beach. This was pretty close. Uh, so, a few moments that I had to remember. Thank you. I think what we're going to do is uh, Morley has put together a video which I think you'll enjoy. So we'll use that to wrap up. There's, there's two spots here which are low spots in this rock wall where almost undoubtedly they had large basketry fish traps uh, kind of weighted down or lashed down in, in those gaps uh, when uh, people were, were actively working this area. And a shot from the backside here looking up uh, at those sort of two gaps. Quite no, there, and also a whole series, I think there was a series of five different traps <laughs> across the, the one river coming in there and then all these side bays had very large distinctive uh, traps and when we did some uh, 
uh, you, you can see there's hardly any rain there that day. <laughs> there was uh, there was fish traps on all the all the side bays and inlets as well. You can see some of the larger rocks that are a bit too big and heavy to move have been left here. Uh, all along the base of the vegetation, there's divots, little hollows from where the rocks have been removed. They're also <coughs> present down the first three meters or so. See, I had far too much time. And, uh, yeah, I had a, a lot of time. I mean, I, we camped on this before and I hadn't noticed before uh, these things. Uh, I have been reviewing, um, you know, professionally some the discussions on uh, intertidal and um, um, estuarine uh, gardens uh, from the pre-contact period. And I think this is a perhaps a, a good candidate for one. You'll see there's, there's a divot there, 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 there. And uh, this beach is unusual in that the rocks are all angular and they don't move around much. And so when a rock's being pulled out, uh, the socket for it stays uh, for, for quite a long time. And uh, I suspect this is an archaeological site that has, that kayak camping has had some uh, detrimental effects to it, but uh, we'll never really know because the rocks aren't there anymore. I think all the rocks are up on the, uh, uh, they've been used to weight down tents over the years. At the top here, virtually continuous. Also, the rocks get lost, so people need to get new ones each year. Lots of uh, what appears to be silverweed. Uh, yeah, so silverweed is one of the main uh, edible plant crops. Uh, wheat plants are pretty rare uh, on the west coast of Vancouver Island and the, the uh, central coast. Uh, silverweed and, uh, and uh, clover species are, are the two main wheat crops that were uh, harvested uh, in wild conditions, but also there's a lot of suspicion there was horticulture going on as well to uh, improve, like enlarge the areas that, that uh, were suitable for it. And I think where we were camping is probably one of these. It was certainly very wet, or sink foil. <laughs> Once it rained for three or four days. But this is a very big old cedar, and uh, there's kindling that's been taken off a dry dead face here, and a long time ago, because there's no axe marks at all. But what there is is wedge marks. Uh, here, another one here. And you can actually, on this one, it looks like, uh, yeah, sometimes you can tell the way from the way the fibers are bent, which way the wedge was was here. So the uh, Northwest Coast people had uh, very complex wedges, very sophisticated wedges with quite complex curves and shapes that they used to uh, remove planks. Uh, also, you, uh, ones at the end of their use life could be made into like this little one on the left hand side here, and that's what would be used to, uh, to take kindling off uh, for firewood. And here's just someone pounding one with a uh, stone hammer. And a set of them in the Royal BC Museum. Uh, you can see uh, just another one here. And maybe one there, but uh, generally they're, they're bashing in the wedges here and then forcing the wood out and it's snapping off at the top. You can see all the brick marks uh, going up. And yeah, we spent a long time trying to uh, get a fire going in those conditions. On the way out uh, of, uh, on our very long day, uh, we passed uh, that red sign there. There's a man holding a copper. Uh, oops, on the, uh, uh, on the way out from Bella Bella, we passed a modern painting on a cliff face that also is uh, uh, one of these copper shapes. And uh, there it is, there's a T design here, and uh, here's a, an old cliff painting uh, from 1908 showing that, the, that and uh, this is, I'm pretty sure that's what we've got here. It's just so faded it's getting hard to see.
so this very, very productive uh, place here has these clam garden walls on all the little coves on the, uh, uh, on the west side. We were there at a zero tide, and these walls are uh, constructed or created at least right at the uh, low tide. There was uh, a number of them along there. And here's my little uh, place of incarceration. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it was surrounded by uh, culturally modified trees. You can see this one here is uh, chopped here, and it, it, it just huge amount of growth. Another type of site we found is, uh, this one was an unrecorded, as I found an archaeological site, with deep, deep shell uh beautiful camping spot. Uh, um, it is a, a, a large village site. Um, everywhere there was exposures, I could see the, um, uh, uh, I could see that, yeah, it was shell midden, but I think luckily in terms of kayakers continuing to use the place, because again, it's one of these few places where there's a, a decent campsite for miles. Um, there, there's a good, uh, the, the shell midden is all protected by subsequent accumulation of, of sediments and soils. Uh, so there shouldn't be any impact from camping there. Uh, unless someone puts a pit toilet in, that, that, could, uh, that could be problematic. And the other thing on, the, uh, on there was uh, bear modified trees. And people who have been listening to me rattle on about culturally modified trees uh, over the years, uh, I think we're interested to hear about bears modified trees as well. Here's one here uh, that was in behind the camp. And uh, here's the top of it. You can see part of the uh, bark hanging off the side there. So the bark's not removed as it would have been uh, from people taking the bark, which leaves a very similar scar. And you can see at the bottom here, there's a bright patch there where the, the teeth marks are. Uh, of the bear biting into the, the base. It, it, grizzly bears are the ones that do this. We don't have, uh, these don't occur on Vancouver Island because we don't have grizzlies here. And the grizzlies do with the... Um, the, the, the biologists I've talked to that saw them do this and, and told us about it uh, said that they thought it was just a way of letting off aggression, particularly when there was other bears in the area uh, where they were having to share resources and they were getting upset. So uh, they kind of tear some bark off the trees and feel better about the <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not sure if that's a Don't good sign for a place to camp or not. <laughs> and here's a close-up of the tooth marks on, on one of the other ones. And these are all relatively recent uh, uh, things. There's the, uh, the camp site again, and you, there's one there, there's another one there. There was also some recent uh, cultural stripping in here too, but there was uh, a lot of bear stripping right from the camp site, which is kind of interesting. But beautiful old village site, very neat. And uh, here's looking up at uh, one of the grand old ones. Uh, there's the top of an old cut uh, from taking the bark off there. And this whole tree has grown up since the uh, since the bark was removed, probably several hundred years ago. And uh, just, I, I just find these things fascinating, even after uh, a lot of decades of looking at them. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, I believe that's the end. Good yeah. job. Yeah. Uh, we could uh, take some questions if you're interested, if you do have any. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Michael. Now, I just have a comment. So Morley, in, in his, his uh, very supportive way, as he's showing us these modified bear trees, telling it's only grizzlies and they're very aggressive. And you can say, you can tell it's really recent. So I say, like, how recent, Morley? Oh, that's really hard to say. <laughs> yes, BJ. On the bear subject, again, did you have bear barrels? Uh, there you go. Health health flex. Uh, meteorologists. <laughs> I think we got it. Yes, we used bear barrels. Uh, I don't know that anybody hung food. I don't think so. We've all got bigger kayaks so we can take bear barrels. That's right. We all about slinging food up. Too long or trips, you need more food. Any more uh, questions? Yeah, go ahead. Was there fresh water at all the campsites? 
No. <laughs> yes and no, right? <laughs> uh, if you had a, a dry period. A dry period. Were yeah. There creeks there, or potable water already there, or? Um, the, the shoreline of the mainland uh, has has water available. Um, we can get water at Calvert. We knew about that at the top of Calvert where we were. But otherwise, the smaller islands, David, um, you're wise to take a good bit of water. I think most of us traveled with 20 liters or more and then would kind of take it when we had a chance. But of course, we could gather it from the downpours. And it's not potable. We, we filter it. Yes. And it's yeah. almost like tea. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Cedar water. Very good for you. Any other questions? Yeah, go ahead, Don. What kind of fish were they catching with the fish traps? Oh, uh, salmon probably in those uh, larger, the small river systems coming in. Uh, certainly pinks would be in there. Um, some of those ones go up to little creeks. There might have been a sockeye run. Uh, I'm not sure about the species. Uh, Elroy White, uh, who's the archaeologist from Bella Bella, uh, whose specialty is fish traps, he'd be the one to know <laughs> that, that, that answer. In the broken group, we were told that there might be mostly sardines or herring. 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 Yeah, but there, there's, a, there's a lot of ethnographic information of, uh, and, and detailed plans of fish traps and that that were used to catch salmon uh, using rock wall traps as well. So. But certainly, uh, some of the small little paint fish and things were uh, were also harvested that way. So, uh, I just didn't have a quick word. Somebody today, when we were on our paddle, said to me, "Well, we we're following your track. Alan has the Enrys, so it's not my track; it's his track, right?" And uh, this couple they commented, "You didn't seem to stop very often." <laughs> called bio-breaks. Yes, that's right. We didn't stop very often. <laughs> it's interesting somebody noticed that on the track. <laughs> yeah. So on the first, did you have to store your propane separately? And if you did, did anybody forget to do that? No. They didn't insist on it. I didn't do it. Um, and did anybody I, forget? I was ready with my stuff separate, and they never asked. Whereas the trip in 2016, yeah, they, made it. they were very careful about it. Yeah, they just didn't care. No. And nobody left it behind. It wasn't separate. Yeah. I just stuck mine in Morty's kayaks. So it's all good. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And before uh, Fred just uh, finishes off here, I wanted to say that uh, we had a, a couple of people asked for more detailed information about this trip, which is quite a great trip. I mean, rain notwithstanding. Uh, this is an amazing area, a challenging area though. And so I've talked to several of the people on the trip and we'll look for a time when we could do a, maybe a Zoom session on this trip and a kind of a Q&A. And maybe by that time, this uh, recording that Tony happily is putting together will be posted on YouTube. You'll have had a chance to look at. If you're really considering this trip, you do need some good information. <laughs> so we'd be happy to share what we learned and uh, knew from before on, uh, on our passage through the Central Coast. Over to Fred. I can honestly say this is probably one of the best trip presentations I've ever seen. So thank you very much, all of you. Wonderful. And I also especially appreciated the way that you divided up the information. Because so many of the trip presentations are not that they're boring, but this is what we did the third day, the fifth day, the ninth day, and stuff like this. But how you came at it from different um, subject areas was, uh, I think, a lot more interesting. So thank you. Okay.